Uh, welcome everybody uh, to what I think is going to be a great conversation with three really fantastic panelists. Um, I, my name is Ruben Tag. I work at uh, PGM Real Estate in the Impact and Responsible Investments Group. Um, we manage the impact investing uh, that comes out of the general account from Prudential. Um, and we are really excited, and I'm really excited, to talk about something, a topic that is closely related to impact investing, and I think in many ways builds on some of the work that many of us have been doing in the field um, in, uh, over the last decade plus. Um, but has kind of taken a lot of the thinking uh, around impact and brought it to a really different level uh, in terms of asset allocation and management. Um, and I've got three people here today who know a lot more about that than I do uh, to talk about it. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Uh, please feel free to put some questions into the chat. We are going to have a Q&A time at the end, um, and I'd love to be able to get to some audience questions. Um, so, uh, you know, share as much as you like. Um, and uh, with that said, uh, why don't we get into it? Uh, our panelists are uh, Christy Hill, um, who is the head of, uh, head of America's Asset Management and the Global Head of ESG at PGM Real Estate. Uh, she's uh, been responsible for leading the way internally on the creation and implementation of our ESG strategy. Uh, along with all of her other responsibilities for asset management across, uh, across the United States and Latin America for the company. Um, and so uh, she's got a great view on how you can tie together, you know, ESG thinking with kind of uh, the work that she's done over her long career in asset management. Uh, joining us as well is uh, Shubha Maheshwari um, with Verdani Partners. Uh, Shuba has uh, over a decade of experience in sustainable real estate, ESG, and architecture. Um, she's worked across a number of different large real estate portfolios, not just Pigeon Real Estate, which is one of Verdani's clients. Um, so she actually brings a perspective, I think, to the table of the entire industry and, and what's happening across other um, asset allocators and with, with ESG more generally. Uh, our third panelist is Kim uh, Pexton from JBG Smith. Uh, Kim is uh, the VP of Sustainability at JBG Smith, which is really one of the leading uh, companies in the industry around ESG implementation. They're an important partner to PGM Real Estate. That's why we brought them here today. Uh, but they obviously have their own portfolio of transactions that uh, you know, they've developed over many years. Um, and I think Kim is a great person to talk about what ESG looks like at the uh, level of the operator or the developer. Um, so with those intros out of the way, um, I'm gonna just jump right in and start asking questions. My first question, uh, Christy, is for you. You know, I'd love it if you could just sort of set the stage for why PGM Real Estate, which has, you know, over $160 billion of AUM, obviously has been very successful at raising capital and, and allocating capital over many years, felt like it was valuable to invest resources in an ESG strategy. Um, and, you know, what did that look like? How did that process sort of take shape? Um, how do you steer such a large ship into using ESG across a portfolio? Um, and, and then to the extent you can talk to what the hopeful outcomes are for ESG, you know, um, long run, uh, that would be great. And we'll kick it off there. Well, first, thank you for having me. Um, it's, a, it's a great panel and um, a really important topic. Um, you didn't leave me off with a softball. That's a deep and meaningful question, so I will try to try to tackle it. You know, I think when you talk about why invest ESG resources, I sort of go back you know, a couple of decades to it used to be sustainability and there was a proven out ROI, and that's really sort of how our industry started to gain a lot of traction. And I think you know, as the space has expanded and as, as, as we've matured as, as owners and investors, we've started to realize that, you know, the value proposition of ESG is not strictly limited to, you know, sustainability components and that there are lots of ways to drive value at an asset. So I think, you know, sort of on the, on the investment front, it's evolved um, truly from an investment perspective and seeing the value that a good ESG strategy can bring to a property um, and to a platform and, and to a fund. But I think it's really, you know, really important, especially after the past 24 months, to also talk about 
you know, the external forces that have also driven commitment to this because we want to do it. Yes, it's the right thing to do. Yes, we think it's a good thing to do from an investment perspective. But now there are you know, third party forces in the way of our own investors and, and the ultimate capital sources that are driving this. Um, there are evolving regulatory environments that are making it you know, a legal obligation um, to do and report on some of these things. Um, but I believe ultimately, you know, we look at ESG as a critical strategy because at the heart of it, we think assets that are more, more durable socially, more durable environmentally, are going to create more durable assets financially through stronger risk-adjusted cash flows. So I think that's that's really the heart of the why. It's, it's we want to do it. We see the investment proposition, but now there's a whole 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 other world telling us now um, that we have to do it. Um, the how. Like how how is rolling this out at an organization like PGM? I wish I could just say hard. It's really hard, and its scale brings with it um, tremendous challenge and tremendous benefit. And that's sort of the the motivation that keeps us going because we know we have this massive platform that if you actually if you take us across debt and equity and you sort of tally up all of the bodies that we touch, it's over three million people. Um, but scaling it means looking at a very large global organization and having to coach up and educate a bunch of experts in a field that they have not previously focused. Um, that's not even the lightest part of the work. That's, that's, very, that's very difficult. And then you get into regional challenges. You, know, you don't collect data the same way in every global region. You, know, you don't get billed for your utilities the same way in every global region. So we want a program that is consistent and rec replicable. We want to be able to dive into those in insights and, and take from them to inform strategies. But there are just certain inherent challenges um, globally when it comes to doing everything the same way. So I think certainly um, that scale is a challenge. But once you get it right, and we think we're getting it right, you know, the scale to the upside is the impact now, now scales with that. Um, and then what are we hoping to get out of it? I think transparency and insight. You know, transparency is something I think we all as a world want more of, um, especially sort of in, in this realm of the investment space. But I think for us, it's really about pulling deep, meaningful insights um, from, our, from our initiatives that will allow us to inform our strategies, um, that will allow us to achieve our goals, you know, both financially you know, and in the ESG world. Great, thank you. Uh, Shuba, could you speak to you, the implementation of the of the measurement and management of ESG and sort of I think for this audience in particular it would be helpful to talk about you know what do each of those three letters mean to a company like PGM Real Estate what are they trying to measure what are they trying to manage for um, and you know what are the contributors that are the most significant to, to each of those pieces of the metric. Sure and um Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited uh, to be on this panel. And Ruben, I'm going to start with your second question first, because I think that um, would set the stage for the first part of it. So if we talk about ESNG, which is environmental, social, and governance, um, it is actually a lens through which we look at things. So it can really mean different things for different people in different companies. Um, I would say that for E, we look at um, we look at things which which would help with resource reduction, such as um, we advocate for practices that would reduce uh, energy, water waste, um, our consumption overall, and which would ultimately also help reduce carbon emissions. Um, and this would create direct business impact. So. E is definitely one of the biggest component um, which has been there. And I, I'll get into some of the key things which impacted after this. Um, and S, I'll say that in the past 10 years, E has been the key focus of the industry, but now may also due to pandemic, it has shifted a little more towards the S. Um, and so now for occupant health, diversity, uh, well-being, mental health, all of these have come to the forefront of it. So I'll say those are the key things which fall under S. It's of course not limited to it. And, and especially because we have a big impact group over here, this is such an important one for them. 
Um, and then on the G side of things, which is governance, it is really what sets the standard and tone of the conduct. So it can um, really mean different things again. So it can be due diligence really for our sake. It is more about due diligence, risk assessment, policies, uh, regulations is a big one. Uh, now that there are so many of them coming up, um, basically ethics, integrity, transparency, all of that fall under governance. Um, so that is, I would say, the key major, you know, conceptually what, what things are. And then um, some of the key things which impact these, I will say, for environment, things that you do at your asset level. Uh, maybe if you're doing certifications, you have audits. Um, I would also put climate risk assessment and mitigation under environment. Um, and then so basically all your activities at asset level, of course, data collection and utility uh, part is a huge, huge part of it. Um, and then under social, it can be various things, again, depending on the type of setup you have. So if, for us, it's mainly tenant engagement, stake, different various type of stakeholder engagement um, that we do. We, there are certain certifications which are more towards health. So I'll say they fall under social as well. Um, and then um, for governance, again, we, we have several regulations and reportings that we need to do, especially with PGM being such a global globally scaled and with every country having its own uh, set of regulations and regions has specific things, um, there's a lot to make sure um, that we are looking at all the risks and mitigating it. Um, so that's that's all of that I'll say falls under governance. And then going back to your first question, which is about how PGM approaches uh, measurement and uh, data, I believe. so. Data collection is, of course, as Chrissy was saying, it is such a such a difficult part. It's, it's huge. And um, so that is something which is really key to the success of the program. And it definitely cannot be done manually or through just spreadsheets. We use uh, Measurable as our partner data platform on that for that. On, on top of that, we also have our in-house tools that we put on a to make our data quality to the level that we need it to be. Um, again, data standardization and the challenges because of the global scale is adds to the lot of complexity over there. Um, but one of the things that I'll say that we make we do is to, to help make sure that our data um, is at a certain level and we are reporting it to the best of our ability. We do data assurance. Um, and we verify it as well uh, to make sure that there is trust built in the quality of data that we produce. And we also set long-term targets and make sure that we are uh, looking at our progress and have a loop so that we can, um, make, we can make our decisions based on the strength and weakness that we find through that. That was a long, wide answer, but this was a loaded question. It was great. It was a big question. It was probably a somewhat unfair question. So uh, thank you for even trying to, to answer it all in, in one go. Um, you know, uh, Chrissy, I'll start with you and then Shiva, I'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, we it's clear that we're most of the way through implementation or I don't know what you what percentage of the way you would say you are through where you want the implementation to be. Um, but obviously a lot of the rollout has happened now. And I'm wondering what, as you've been rolling out and implementing the strategy has been that biggest obstacle that you had to get past, um, you know, with either internally, externally, whatever the, the sort of biggest factor was that, that you had to push through. Well, I will say I feel very lucky to work um, for an organization like PGM Real Estate because there wasn't, you know, there wasn't an internal hurdle to get over to say this was important. I think I think there are still some firms where people are trying to prove this is important and, and still making the argument. And I, I feel very lucky and or fortunate to work for a firm that understands the importance of this. So I don't think there were there were there wasn't the convince the firm hurdle, um, which which makes it nice. And that a lot of firms do have that. So I think for us, it goes back to that scale question. And it's easy to do one thing right once. It's very hard to do that same thing right consistently, you know, a couple thousand times. And I think the challenge that that we have is that people want mess, people want change quickly. And when you're working with a large firm, even using the example of you know our reducing our emissions and reducing our consumption, this isn't one solution that we are scaling across 2,000 properties. This is and making that number up, but this is truly 2,000 bespoke solutions. 
And before you can even get to the solution, you have to dig in to a granular level at every one of those properties to understand what the problem is at that property. One property may have a water issue. One might be you know, a utility, you know, an electricity issue. So it's really, you, you solve this problem bottom up and top down. And I think, you know, thankfully, again, the top down for us was an easier solve, but it's really execution. And it's not so much that it's a challenge. It's just that it takes dedication, disciplines, discipline, perseverance. You, you just can't let your foot off the gas because we've got a big portfolio and it's, you, you can't cast a wide net. You really have to focus on every individual asset. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'll say just I'm relatively new to PGM, but one of the things that has impressed me is that ESG isn't just your job or Shuba's job. It's like a part of everybody's job. And that seems like it wouldn't, it just wouldn't work without that. There's no way it could work. I mean, there, it's, it, you need, we need boots on the ground around the globe. And it's also a philosophical commitment from everyone in the firm. You know, it's, it's, it's not just, you know, giving work to an analyst. It's really understanding why we're doing what we're doing and, and making sure that we're communicating that message. Shuba, you, any, you want to add something there? I think just to add to this point, um, it is so important for the ESG team to be like, even having the ESG team is not enough until it is integrated into all aspects of the business. I think that is such an important part of it um, to be, to work closely with, with diff different businesses. So I'll say that is one thing um, that, that that is very, very important. And um, I won't say it is a challenge. It is something that, in fact, I'll say that we have made tremendous pro progress on. I, I think Christy covered it pretty well. I really don't have much to add over there. Well, I'll keep you on the hot seat though. Uh, so as you're thinking about, you know, what you've seen now within the implementation at PGM Real Estate and what has sort of, what you alluded to in terms of where the industry was, the focus on E that has kind of dominated the last 10 years, um, but with more and more sort of operators and allocators kind of adding ESG guidance to their management strategies and figuring out how to get their hands around their portfolios from these perspectives, you know, what would you say just in the last two years has kind of been the trajectory um, and, and the sort of most important trends within the sector uh, around ESG implementation? Um, so I'll start with um, net zero and climate risks, which have become really, uh, climate risk has come to the forefront and it, it is now an investment risk. It's not even looked at as a risk, uh, which is different to that anymore. So I would say that is such a huge shift that has happened, which has also helped move the needle on net zero um, and, and the progress that we are seeing on that front, because just, I think until last year or just end of 2020, a lot of companies were still thinking about that, oh, should we do net zero? Should we commit to it or not? And now that is not even a question. Now the question is, how soon are you going to achieve it? So that has uh, that has been such a huge shift uh, in terms of the conversation around it, and it has accelerated ESG and brought it to the front and center of everything. Um, the other shift that I see is on the regulatory front, uh, with so many regulations, and of course with PGM being global, that impacts global firms are way more impacted by that because thing, regulations coming out of Europe, for example, um, they not only impact Europe, they also impact other countries, which, which, um, which has been a shift and, and we'll see more and more of them coming. It is not, there's no stopping there. Um, so those are some of them. And again, I mentioned social before that has been another shift, which, which we are seeing, uh, coming. Um, and so these are some of the some of the shifts that I, I would highlight. Great. Thank you. And, and I now want to bring Kim in on that point, Kim, at the level of your firm, you know, uh, and you, you haven't been with JBG Smith forever. So you've got actually some perspective from the broader industry as well, but, I, I would love to hear kind of how, you know, you've seen JBG kind of work through some of the things that Shuba was talking about, you know, the, the sudden mm -hmm. kind of seriousness about the climate risk and, and right. change and, and also the, the kind of true integration of the S, like trying to actually put some meaning around that and, and whether those are trends that have affected the way that 
JBG Smith approaches ESG investing? Yeah, I would, um, again, thanks for having me. Um, just really quickly, for those of you who might not know who GBG Smith is, we are um, an owner, operator, developer in the, the Washington, D.C. metro area with a diverse portfolio, of both office, multifamily, and a little bit of, of retail um, kind of peppered in there. Um, so to answer your, your question, Ruben, you know, we, you know, seeing over the last, you know, 30 years just of my career, being able to see how sustainability and ESG has evolved from really um, policy-based, you know, it, it, it was a handful of years ago that folks had been talking about the fact that, you know, we're talking about ESG and sustainability, but we're not necessarily seeing uh, globally reductions in carbon emissions. And well, why is that? And really the primary reason for this is that the infancy of ESG was focused on policy. And so over the last handful of years, it's really been a major shift to results and not just results, but and fast, like stat. When are we, when are, when are we getting this done? To Shuba's point, it's, it's not even a question of, of net zero. Um, it's when are you, when are you going to get there? When are you going to hit that target? And so when, as JBG Smith, as we're looking at some of these, you know, particular issues, we went ahead and, um, and established the commitment for carbon neutrality um, across our operating portfolio and specifically for, uh, for the energy that is, that is used to operate our buildings. That was, if you can imagine, a lot of various conversations over the course of, uh, of about a year and a half to make that decision and just go ahead and do that. The reason that that ends up being so important to just at least make that step is because now our focus can shift 100% on net zero. And we've got that out of the way. Those conversations are done. Our exec executive committees, our investment committee has been fully debriefed on the various language, et cetera, and so forth. And it really, it really smooths the path for the discussions that are going to continue to happen over the next year or so as we establish our roadmap for, uh, for net zero. And so I think that's, I think that's a, really, uh, a really important element. I think the other thing that we realized too is that you know, we've seen in the last couple of years that the impacts of climate change and the impacts of social, social justice are two things that are not being, they're being felt together. They're not necessarily separate. And um, so those are things that we see being a driving force. We're very fortunate that in 2019, we had an addition of a vice president of diversity and inclusion in our organization that has really started to, um, you know, has built a great foundation of a more inclusive JBG Smith at the corporate level. And it's, it's been awesome fuel for looking at sustainability in other business units. For example, um, our leasing team um, intentionally um, has, has leased um, in the retail space to local businesses and minority owned businesses. And we actually report those stats out um, annually. And it's been, it, it, it's just because of that recognition that from a social value perspective in the communities in which we serve, where we're developing, um, that development really has a major impact on the social engagement of people in neighborhoods, the community that's being created. And so creating a retail profile that looks more like the community that you're going into has been a very intentional thing from a, from a social perspective as well. So those are just a few, um, a few highlights of, of the way that we're looking at that. That's great. And, and so building on that, you know, as you're starting to think about, you know, having you've made these commitments, you've got you know, sort of the organization aligned around them, you're implementing within the organization these commitments to social justice and diversity and inclusion, you know, how does that affect when you're out in the field trying to buy assets? How does that change the way that you might look at asset selection or how you might operate a particular asset? 
So it definitely, it definitely, you know, um, there's a lens, you know, that, that is, is developed there. Um, you know, we, Jamie Smith works to integrate ESG management across all of our business units. And as you're suggesting, Ruben, what this really means is that, um, you know, it's, it's not one blanket over each business unit. You're aligning the ESG related um, dimensions and, and metrics and KPIs with the KPIs of that particular business unit. So development, they're looking to, you know, develop high quality buildings that attract tenants or residents and um, come in on time under budget. So how from a, from a sustainability perspective, do you integrate various objectives of reducing productive energy consumption by a certain percentage, et cetera, and so forth. So when we work with our investment teams, um, our due diligence list starts to incorporate um, within that process, looking at climate change and, and uh, resiliency of a particular property and identifying, are we going to be subject to having to harden um, in, in the future because of, of various uh, climate change related um, elements. Um, we look at the local laws to understand sort of that transitional uh, risk as, as the jurisdictions that we work in who have all set their own um, climate related goals. How do we partner with them? What is our place in actually helping them advance their own objectives while also advancing our own and creating that that symbiotic relationship. So we we take a hard look at um, building energy performance standards and energy benchmarking laws and and things like that in that diligence stage. Um, and the idea with with building um, building an arsenal of all that information is that you're you're building a more robust profile of that particular asset. So just like you're, you've done for years in the diligence process and, and doing, you know, facility condition assessments, we, we blend in energy audits and really create that robust picture so that we, that we understand exactly what we, uh, what we need to do and develop, as Christy has suggested, a bespoke plan for, for, the, for that particular asset. So, so we know what we need to invest by way of of energy efficiency, et, et cetera, um, in that acquisition process. Um, on the run side, our asset management teams across our office portfolio, residential and retail, we work with those asset managers specifically on their budgeting and capital improvement and ROI project planning. We work with them to incorporate energy efficiency work that's designed to meet the specific performance targets that we have set to achieve by 2030 and also maintain a carbon neutral portfolio, but also looking at, um, you know, the future, uh, future laws and other things that are, that are coming down um, uh, the pike um, on that. And it's, and it's really, you know, and it, that's, that's really how we, you know, we work to, to capture and integrate and ensure that those elements are implemented. We have a, an accountability loop where we work with the teams to keep track of those energy efficiency projects and make sure that what was planned actually gets executed because it's no good to make a plan and not actually, you know, kick some of those things down into, you know, future years like we've all experienced if something doesn't get done in a particular year. So... Great. And thank you for stepping us through that sort of, you know, acquire and run process. And Christy, I wanted to kind of jump to the other end of the cycle with you and think about exits and disposition. Um, and, you know, is there something that we, you know, that you are now thinking about as an asset owner around ESG management that is important on the disposition side and who your buyers are going to be in a few years? I, I, I'd love to hear kind of how that it plays out there. No, absolutely. And I think you know, Kim just answered that question so eloquently. And even just hearing how she was talking about it, I think it underscores actually something that Cuba said of this is investment risk. Like if you think about the way 
Kim just walked us through what she's thinking about with ESG. It's the same way you underwrite a market from a leasing perspective. What's my pipeline? You're talking about, you know, your your retail synergies. You know, I think it really just shined a bright light on this is also good business. This is what will help you drive return. It's just, I, I start to talk about, it's just a new bucket of risk that you have to consider along with all of the other you know buckets that are in our DNA as real estate people to think about. Um, and, and I think that speaks to your exit strategy. I mean, if you're not running the property like that, you've got nothing to sell and exit. And look, I think the market that we are in today is going to be dram is dramatically different than the market that we were in two years ago. And I think two years from now, it's I, I don't see, you know, to the we want it now stat, you know, I think that intensity is going to continue in this space. And so I think if you are if you are looking to deliver um, certainly into an institutional exit. If you're a value play that's a build to core, your core investors are absolutely looking at these things. Um, I think all institutional investors are looking at these things. And it's critical that you are able to deliver that, that sort of, I think, superior environmental profile um, to maximize value. Now, that said, it doesn't mean if a building doesn't have a positive environmental profile, you're not going to acquire it. I think that we also, you know, speaking to it as investment risk, investment risk is actually what creates investment opportunity. And so I think it's really important that, you know, you don't think of, you know, when we're selling a property or buying a property, you know, you don't want to eliminate the concept of buying a building with a poor ESG profile, um, because I think there's true value add opportunity there. But as, a, as an owner that's selling into a market, um, we would prefer not to leave that value on the table for someone else and, and deliver the property with the strong, you know, the strong profile to, to maximize um, that exit. But I think, I think that very quickly we're going to see all owners starting to care about this, um, institutional and otherwise, and otherwise. And it also speaks to, you know, what Kim and Shuba have been talking about. As the regulatory environment shifts, there are going to be incentives that are carrots turning to sticks in terms of penalties. And so I think you really, as a buyer, you know, whether or not you believe in ESG or not, you're gonna believe in the million dollar a year penalty that your property faces if you don't get your act together. And so I think that that evolving market will also accelerate um, and broaden, I think the group of people that really need to focus on this from the business perspective. I think you'll certainly have for an extended period of time, small operators potentially flying under the radar and um, I think that's a solution we need to really start to figure out as a as a world. You know, it's it's we're sitting here as large organizations with with capital, and if I need to spend a couple million dollars to upgrade a building, I can do that. There are owners out there that don't have that ability, and I think that's that's a that's an issue that we're going to have to solve because I do think this is a space where we all win when we all win. And while obviously as PGM Real Estate, we always want to outperform, we also feel a responsibility to make sure, you know, everybody out there is contributing to these same goals. That's like the perfect uh, jumping off point for the next topic, actually. Thank you. Uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the relationship between ESG and impact investing, right? With, where impact investing, the way impact investors think of themselves is they start with a positive end goal or end state, and they figure out how they're going to get there through an investment strategy, roughly speaking. And you know, your, your characterization of the ESG ethos and the, the, you know, dealing with it first as an, perhaps an investment risk strategy, but then thinking about it really as a, as a market-based strategy and what is the market that we're in and, and what, what do we want all of the assets in the market to eventually look like and have those characteristics, you know, adopts a little bit of that impact investing framework, I think. Um, and so I'm curious about, you know, how you think of those two things as related, you know, several years ago, PGM Real Estate entered, you know, into the impact investing space, you know, on its own launching a product. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering how you see the, the, the nexus between those two pieces of the business. Yeah, and I, you know, I think um, if somebody might have said it earlier, I kind of view ESG as the lens through which we have to digest all investments, where I look at impact as a very specific investment strategy. So it's one of our funds across the spectrum of products. Um, that said, I think they're closely related because you're looking to you're 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 looking for similar outcomes and, and returns in both. So where I think that nexus is is really in 
taking the best of both worlds and applying to them, you know, applying to each other as applicable. So if we're thinking about some of the services that we're implementing in our residential portfolio on the impact side, and we're seeing that drive you know, retention and we're seeing that drive community engagement and, and we're seeing that you know, maybe help advance rental rates depending on the structure of the asset, you know, there's no reason why that approach or that strategy needs to be contained in the impact strategy. We can borrow from that and spread it and, and scale it across you know, our whole our whole multifamily, our whole multifamily portfolio. And, and the converse is if we're doing something that is particularly beneficial in your know, standard market rate, you know, com in commercial apartment buildings, you know, there's no reason why that has to stay limited there. We want to provide the same level of service across our platform. And we want to make sure almost to Kim's example of making sure we're delivering a retail property that is that speaks to its market. We want to make sure we're doing that with every property we deliver, because that's ultimately what makes the property successful. Um, so I think it's about taking the, you know, we're, we're very fortunate to have a very large data set. And I think that they can both inform each other. Great. Uh, Kim, you know, thinking about how JBG Smith approaches this, I know that you all have direct initiatives that you're involved in in impact investing. You know, in your work, do you kind of see that that same crossover that Christy was talking about, where one idea from you know one side of the work can kind of inform the other one, or where ESG can be a mechanism for scaling impact, or vice versa? I'd love to hear kind of how that's playing out with with the work that you've been doing. Yeah, it's it's definitely um, you know how we how we typically um, approach things. You know, we're we're big on pilots. Right. So like, we, we tend to pilot things for a few months, see how it goes, do a little evaluation and then roll it out and, and scale it, which, which is smart. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great prudent approach. So um, that works really well for us. And I think, I think that is, it's a scalable and very simple approach, quite frankly. I and mean, we've, we've done um, various things from energy efficiency projects, you know, uh, window fill. You know, leasing agents do not, our, our leasing team hates film on, um, on office windows, right? And lo and behold, somehow we found out about a product that you roll on a window and it dries clear and it, and it has the same properties um, from, a, you know, from a, a thermal heat gain, you know, kind of perspective as regular film great, let's pilot it. All right, we're going to, you know, put it out there at scale. So is it, for me, it's really fun to do those projects because it does take me, take me a little bit back to my background, which was, you know, in, in building construction for, uh, for a lot of years. So, um, and then, you know, from, you know, we do, we do sort of a little bit of the same thing, even on the social side, you know, our, I had mentioned before our, our VP of diversity and inclusion, she is, is specifically working on sort of that, that corporate human capital level and really, um, you know, as I mentioned before, creating that culture of inclusivity, but also there's training components. What, you know, we've all gone through um, unconscious bias awareness um, training and, and various elements like that. And those do, um, you know, spur ideas. I mean, ultimately that spurred the idea in our retail team to actually um, develop a more intentional plan of how they were going to look at leasing and bringing in more local and more um, more minority businesses. So that was that was that's a direct linkage between uh, some things that you're doing in one space, just generating ideas across the various business units of how they can use that particular information and that experience and relate it to what they're doing you know, in their, in their particular um, uh, business unit. I wanted to talk a little bit, you know, uh, specifically that uh, um, with just what was going on with respect to affordable housing in the development space for us. A lot of times affordability comes up in the entitlement process. Um, and what that ends up looking like is some kind of a price break, price break for, um, you know, a percentage of, of units within a multi-family building. And um, to, to me, and I'm sure other affordable housing professionals out there uh, really don't necessarily view that, you know, as true affordability. 
JBG Smith sort of recognized that and actually got engaged with the Washington Housing Conserv Conservancy um, and, um, and the Washington Housing Initiative where we actually act as the impact pool manager. And part of that process as the impact pool manager is that we help identify um, potential acquisitions. We go through the same kinds of uh, diligence processes that we go through for you know, acquiring um, other assets that, that are ultimately going to, um, come into come into the REIT. Um, and we, we developed various social dimensions and sustainability dimensions to review in that process that mirror some of what we're doing in the REIT space with, uh, with ESG and our larger portfolio. So again, um, you know, focusing on some of those things start to inspire various um, ideas and practices. And, and that has evolved to a space where we're, we're specifically identifying um, the amount of affordable housing and workforce housing that we've preserved in each acquisition. We're reporting out annually on those social dimensions, as well as the sustainability dimension. So we're reporting on the carbon, the energy, the energy use, water, waste, all of those dimensions for that pool um, of, of projects that have come out of um, that particular um, Washington Housing Conservancy effort. Well, oh, that's great. And, and, you know, as someone who has seen a lot of different impact investment strategies, uh, particularly multi-asset strategies come and go, one of the challenges for, for those of us who are investing in them is oftentimes coaching the asset manager to provide that kind of reporting and being able to provide that cross-portfolio look. Um, Shuba, I'm just curious, you know, to me, like Chrissy and Cam are obviously extremely adept and, uh, you know, uh, careful spokespeople for you know, understanding these relationships and, and being really thoughtful about how, you know, this kind of work can influence the industry and, and where it's going. What do you think? Is this, you know, is this where all everyone in the industry is headed? You know, what would you say the mix is right now in terms of viewpoints around ESG and impact investing across, you know, other real estate platforms, the industry more generally? I would say in general, there is definitely a rise in interest on the impact side of things. Um, and to me, as a ESG, I mean, I can I can say it from the consultant or like a person who is focused on the ESG aspects of things. To me, it is still pretty uh, similar things that I would do if I had to approach that fund and you know help help them with their ESG features and. And Kim did a great job on touching on a lot of those things is that in, in the industry, even if that fund is an impact like or a non-impact, I would still work on uh, making their energy, water, waste more efficient and which would, of course, help them reduce their cost and their bills and make it more affordable. Um, and I know that these features are being Im implemented by a lot of ESGs getting Im implemented by a lot of funds in general uh, with like as um, on the social factor, like I was saying before, which is of course um, the bigger focus of an impact fund. That is not just limited to impact anymore. Like a lot of other funds are also making sure that they have a good focus on that. I would say that there is a lot of interest that is building around impact um, overall. Um, but I'm, I also wanted to point out that I see that everyone pretty much wanting to do more than what they were doing on the social aspects, even if they are not just an impact fund in general, because everyone sees a lot of value in that. Um, and in fact, there have been research which has shown that um, a lot of like funds which which perform higher on the social side um, compared to other metrics of ESG, they outperform some of the other funds um, well. So, well, there have been a lot of research on these aspects, but they, I feel like this is a, a good one to look at because this is something where the trend is moving towards and, um, and a, a lot more people are adopting it. 
Great. Thank you, Shuba. And I'm going to keep you on the hot seat and start to switch to some audience Q&A um, and because what, something you said prompted some discussion in the chat that I've had like half an eyeball on here, which is, okay. you know, what are the tools that we're using to assess ESG metrics at scale? I think you mentioned measurable. Um, are there mm -hmm. other kind of data services that we're, we're making use of to, to, for implementation? Um, yeah, there, there are many different services. So, so measurable is just for us to um, have a data platform because we cannot do it manually on spreadsheets. But I was, as I was saying that we also have our internal other tools which we use um, to keep to create our strategy to determine okay which what is that asset what, which are the different assets that we want like Christy was saying to have a game plan for an asset. We have internal tools that we have developed to come up with those and to have a game plan for an asset for multiple years. Um, so we use that. And then we also have climate risk and resilience that we are looking into heavily. And we have tools and vendors that we use separately. Like we, we look at 427, for example, as one of our vendor uh, to look at our various climate physical risks um, at, at, at asset and portfolio level both. Um, so we, we do use, other vendors, depending on um, what kind of data and metric are we looking into um, with these two as examples. I think you know, if you don't mind, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Kim. I was just going to say, Ruben, if you don't mind, I wanted to hop in because I certainly don't want to scare anyone in the audience away. You know, um, I would say that at, at the moment, JBG Smith has, has a, has a um, um, you know, a, a much smaller <laughs> portfolio than, than PGIM. And quite frankly, a lot of what we do is still in spreadsheets. So I would, I would say that, you know, there, there are, there are um, organizations and, um, you know, that you can look to for what indicators, you know, that you, that you want to track and build metrics around, but don't be afraid to start in spreadsheet because starting in spreadsheet is still good way to go <laughs> Do, doing something that's where we started nothing but i also think it's you know there is um, a ton of money flooding into the vc space around esg and so i think we're, we're going to start to see more and more tools at more reasonable costs um, and then we're also seeing you know this is sort of the, the more mundane side of esg but even you know groups like grads come out with tools that are, are facilitating reporting as the regulatory environment gets more and more intense. So I, you know, from my position, everything we want to accomplish in ESG, we're going to need to rely on technology and we're going to need to even rely on technologies that we don't have today to get us where we need to go. It's going to be a really critical part of the, of the path. Great. The, the audience has also provided a, a thornier question and I'll, I'll put this out there as a toss up um, for anyone who wants to, to jump on it. Uh, you know, it, it, it must be, um, or it probably is, that there are trade-offs at times between environmental and social issues or between wanting to push harder on one side versus another. Um, you know, an example of that might be, you know, if you're going to make an investment in a building to make it more energy efficient, who's going to pay for that? Are there tenants that are going to pay for that, um, you know, long run um, versus short run? And, you know, are there examples you can think of in your work where you you face that kind of tension, um, and how do you manage that, or how do you think about that? You know, as it as it comes up. I have a, I mean, Christy, if you want to go, and I have a specific example too, so go ahead. Sorry. I, maybe I'll hit it quickly because I think that you know, look, we've actually had sort of green leasing in place for a long time, which really dictates how you expense share at a property. So that's. That's again, we've, we've sort of been talking about a lot of these concepts without having a name on them for quite a while. So, you know, if you're doing a retrofit in an office building or an industrial building, there's a mechanism in place where tenants and landlords share that cost, you amortize it, it's not overly burdensome. Um, so I think that there are structures in place through green leases that really facilitate that partnership. And I do think it needs to be a partnership. This only gets solved if we make it everyone's job. Um, I think where it becomes maybe a little bit trickier is in the multifamily space where you don't have those same, you don't have those same agreements in place. The leases are very different, the utilities are, are individual. And so I think you do um, run into some, you, you run into a different boat of challenges there. 
Um, but at the end of the day, I I think I saw part of the, the question pop in when it was there. You know, I think doing the right thing for the building environmentally is doing the right thing for your tenants. And again, we know through COVID and, and even as we look at climate change that underserved communities are hit disproportionately. So I, I believe there may be times when you are making decisions about expenditures, but I don't think that doing the right thing environmentally in your property or is, is ever at a trade-off to your community that you house because it only benefits them and vice versa, doing the right thing by your community, I think only benefits the investment. So you're always making financial decisions in, in our roles, but ultimately I don't, I, I think those two things actually go hand in hand. Sorry, Lisa, I said I'd make it quick. That wasn't very quick. <laughs> I was just going to share, you know, one example, sort of trade-offs and, um, you know, uh, just echoing what Christy said, you know, um, because, you know, um, social justice and climate justice are not necessarily separate. So really anything that you are doing on that environmental side is, um, is a social benefit. It's reducing carbon emissions, which, you know, which impacts the air that we breathe and impacts the health of our communities. So that's so it, so it is really, truly all um, all interwoven. But, you know, we 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 have been running into a challenge with respect to deploying more on site solar and the and, uh, you know, just from from a penciling financially, you know, how how can we deploy on-site solar when there are other related projects and ways that an asset manager can spend the dollars on a particular asset? And um, we've been very successful with LED lighting retrofits and uh, uh, variable frequency drive deployments and, you know, and things like that. Um, but solar is, is, is a bit tough and it's even tougher, quite frankly, in the Northern Virginia market. Um, so where we have landed because of that is we are focusing more heavily on our development pipeline and incorporating on-site solar into our new developments, which just so happens to be a little bit driven by the fact that our local jurisdictions are requiring solar on our buildings. So we're really kind of taking that opportunity, a challenge that we have on our existing footprint to try to see what we can do on the existing because somewhere in the future, as Christy mentioned, there are going to be possibilities and doors that are open in the future that we don't even, or, or we can't even imagine yet. So at some point it'll be ripe to, to, um, to deploy, but it's, it's the same thing with, you know, with other you know, capital expenditure considerations. But I think Kim's example also shines a great light on the conversion of carrot to stick, you know, in terms of, you know, were we getting an incentive to do the solar? No. Okay, now there's no incentive there. It's challenging financially. People may be split on doing it, but then code evolves and now you have to. So right. it's, yep. it just shows you know, the way the, the markets are evolving um, to get us there. And I think that that's going to be, now that level sets in that market. Christy, you're just like mastering these segues. I, totally uncoached. I mean, couldn't be because this is spontaneous Q and A. But the, the the next question actually is is pulling back to that macro uh, sort of view and what what are those pressures, those societal pressures or societal shifts that are really motivating the uptake and analysis of ESG. You know, the the questioner. Uh, noted the you know sort of a generational shift among shareholders in com in public companies and and maybe people who are you know uh, investing in other ways are have different demands than their parents did for their portfolio um, and I'm I'm wondering if if any of you uh, have thoughts on you know what are some of those other broader societal factors um, that are meaningful in kind of pushing us forward on this journey. I think we're definitely seeing a generational shift. Um, I will be very transparent when I say we don't necessarily see it in renter selection, which is interesting because we see it pronounced through upwards through our investors. We get that pressure from them. We know the public company side, you see sort of the outcry um, that, that, that results in action. But um, when the rubber meets the road and people are walking into our leasing offices, um, it's not always pronouncing in the way people make their own personal decisions. I mean, I think economics, you know, often dictate and that's a very real thing if you've got x amount of dollars to spend on rent in a month you have x amount of pool but i think one thing i want to touch on that i think is interesting in this is you talk about societal pressure 
Um, I think we have a largely domestic crowd on this call, but going back to the challenges of scale and the challenges of ESG, and the S is different globally. And I think that's something that for a global advisor, we also need to be very aware of that in certain parts of the world, it may be um, healthy, safe working conditions. In some parts of the world, it is social housing. In some parts of the world, it's affordable housing. And then you jump across the pond to the US and you know, clearly with social unrest, it's social justice and it's DEI. So I think a big part of ESG, when you think about it globally is also, you know, the S is really a little bit of all of that, um, but it's pronounced differently in different regions. So we've got to be aware of all of those societal pressures to make sure that we're delivering on our investment proposition in each of those regions. Yeah, Mershuba, unless you want to jump in on that, I think I may note that we're coming up on time here. I think Christy did a great job. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. A plus answer. All right. Um, well, I you want to thank all three of you for a really terrific conversation. Uh, this has been, uh, you know, super interesting for me. I've, I've learned a lot and, uh, you know, I think given the, um, the liveliness of the questions from the audience, I think, uh, you know, the, the, Material was well received and gave everyone a really some really great food for thought. Um, and uh, just want to uh, say I hope that we all get to see each other at SoCap in person sometime, uh, hopefully in 2022. So for friends and colleagues and so forth out there in in the chat and in webinar world, and with my own colleagues here in front of me, I, I do hope that. 2022 is able to bring us together in person to continue to talk about it and work on these issues. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you.